Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Again, we've had some audio technological difficulty, but nonetheless, we are continuing to proceed as God would have us to do in this hour. Our scripture is found in Acts chapter 1, verse number 11, 8 through 11. And uh, this has to do with Jesus' departure. Uh, Jesus departs earth as he proceeds back to heaven. Here we want to talk about from these melody of scriptures a paradigm shift, a model, and a way of doing something. My brothers and sisters, I want to not only say what we are looking at dealing with today, but we are also considering the fact that this is our Second Baptist Church uh, 75th anniversary. Uh, what a joy and privilege it is to stand today in acknowledgement from whence the Lord has brought us from. And it's because God has been good to us, he has been by our side, he has provided for us over the years. It's a privilege to be the third part of what God is doing in the whole. Um, let me say that I am grateful to be the church's third um, leader or one whom the Lord has sent to offer uh, guidance and prayer and leadership to a ministry that I did not feel I was worthy of and sometimes even now I don't feel that I'm worthy but somehow God has uh, insisted and superimposed upon me that I am the one obviously uh, if you've been anywhere hanging around long enough for more than 25 years, then there has to be some divine purpose and reason why God has done what he has done. And so here it is today as we lift to celebrate this 75th anniversary, as we talk about, well, what then, Reverend, will you say relative to this uh, 75th anniversary. Just hold on, can I put a comma there for a minute? I'll come back to get you, I promise you. But while also this is something that I have been following the timeline of Jesus as it pertains to the marking of Ash Wednesday and then moving all the way uh, to where we are today. And I might add that here we are on the 37th day after Jesus' uh, uh being raised from the dead, uh, Jesus' resurrection, that's what I was trying to say, and all that has taken place since his resurrection has similar to me, been all a part of the preparation that is going to be required and what is essential and what is necessary for the kingdom of God to continue to move forward. And what I have discovered more than anything else that in this timeline, God has allowed me to see some stuff and things that I ain't never seen before. And might I add, I've been moved, I've been baffled about what God has shown me as it relates to the revelation of God. And even as we have moved in this timeline, I believe God has spoken parenthetically about what it is that he's trying to say to us. And then what is our module for reception and receiving what God has to say? I consider this even in our 75th anniversary. I consider even walking the timeline of Jesus. And now Jesus stands here 37 days according to the book of Acts where it did say that he was seen by his disciples for 40 days and when you mark the trail, when you follow the trail, it will lead you, it will cause you that as of this day, allegedly, that Jesus had been moving for 37 days. Might I add, the trilogy of God, it always seemed to come up. Now, how is it that here we are today celebrating 75 years in ministry? What might God be saying in all of this? I'm glad you asked. Three more days, Jesus will ascend according to the timeline. In, in other words, he's going to go back to the Father. And I want to suggest 
that what might have been some things that Jesus said upon his departure. What might have Jesus been saying back to his disciples and all of those who were looking up at seeing Jesus being raised into the cloud? I'm wondering as I have reviewed the text, it does not suggest that he said anything, but I like to believe when I think about humanity, when I consider my own and our hermeneutic, in other words, it is through our lens and our culture in which we come to know God or in ways in which we can see God and there we receive imagination or understanding of what are some possibilities that Jesus could have uttered on his way uh, to be with his father. Let me hasten down or slow down a little bit to say what I really want to talk about in the combining of our celebrating 75 years and then to mark the trail of Jesus going back to be with the Lord. What does this all mean? I believe, number one, that for a controlling thought that Jesus was trying to introduce us or trying to help us to see that he has only put in place during his 40 days of how he was seen with his disciples and all of the lessons to be gained and learned from doubting Thomas all the way to his half-brother James, who did not believe in him first up front as they were growing up. But after the resurrection, James seems to find some reason of validity to believe in his earthly brother who he did not know or understand pre-resurrection. But it seems to me that a myriad of activities occurred following Jesus' resurrection that was setting things in order in lieu or in light of his departure. He wanted to make sure that everybody understood what he was doing by setting up the kingdom upon his departure. I'm clear as I have followed the timeline that Jesus was intentional that Jesus calculated this moment and Jesus took the time himself to teach the disciples and help them to understand fully what it was that he wanted them to know. Thank you, Jesus. And when I talk about a paradigm shift, it's interesting, I'm sure you want to know, what do you mean, Reverend, a paradigm shift? For, my, for those of you who are intellectual, those of you who have a lofty education, those of you who are love to read and perhaps very familiar with the term used, paradigm shift. I want to speak more to that, but what I believe more than anything else in Jesus' resurrection or on his way to go home to be with daddy, so that he could take up residence around the table to sit on the right hand of God. I believe that in Jesus' departure, as they look at him, as they look on him, the Bible said they were staring at him. It's like, mm, think about this. You ever had to leave your family member at any point in time? You ever uh, went to the bus station to get on a bus? Those that brought you to the bus station wanted to see you bye-bye, at least to wait till the bus pulled off. And you went on your merry way wherever you were going. Uh, how about those of us who fly or during the time when we were doing a lot of flying? You ever uh, escorted or assisted anybody to go to the airport? And you uh, uh, want to make sure that they are okay and that they have everything that they need. Uh, somehow, they, you, you stand in the gate and you watch them uh, go through the gate. They get on the plane. They just be waving. They go on to the plane and find themselves a seat while they are getting prepared on the tarmac. While they are uh, getting ready to lift off, you're still standing looking out the windows in the airport and you, you maintain view of that plane that they got on. And you see them go to the tarmac to get instructions. 
to pull off from the tarmac and that the air traffic control give them their sequence number of flight of departure. And while you still remain in the airport gazing and looking at that particular aircraft that they have, your friend of your neighbor of your loved one is sitting on. And it's amazing how we stand there because some of us in our loved ones assisting them to leave, we feel this sadness that come upon us. We feel somewhat burdened because they are leaving us and somehow we our feelings and our love and regards for them, it causes us to have an emotional arousal. Sometimes when there is a departing of our loved one, depart. I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm trying to say. I got a lot to say and I got a little time to do it in. I know the enemy has already tried to trip us up, but I thank God for the spiritual power of resilience. That when one system does not work, sometimes we got to revert back to the old time way. And I'm glad today that maybe what I'm also seeing here is that when God shut us all down some nine weeks ago when we came to our church to try to upload our sermon. We didn't have a nice computer system in place for us to do this. I remember just pulling out my Android phone and standing in front of me and I uploaded the first message when the church was shut down. I'm finding this interesting. We come back here today and the enemy tried to shut us down. And maybe God is saying even in that that you got to revert back to the old time way. I thought we were just going to end it and not do it at all. But as we begin to converse, the Holy Spirit said, just pull out your Android. Put it down in front of you. Because there's a whole lot of folk out there that's waiting to hear what you got to say. I know you've been uploading stuff on Facebook. You've been putting flyers out there left and right. Many who are reading it were saying, hmm, he sure putting stuff out on Facebook. Yeah! I ain't doing the Lord, did it? Can I say, I'm blessed and highly favored. The Lord gave me a companion that don't mind doing, no, no, let me just go on here. You don't need to know all that. But what I'm trying to say is that when we came here nine weeks ago, my own phone to upload on Facebook Live and many joined in. And when I thought we was high tech, motivated and ready to move in the nuance of technological resources, I found that I had to pull out my hands on the end in order for us to now be where we are. I think God just sent us a message. Okay, let me move on. What is then, Reverend? A paradigm shift. So glad you asked. Let, let me try to explain it like this. When General Motors were established their assembly line of automobiles, I'm going all the way back to the T Model 4 days. Even then, there was a time in how we used to get around with a, a mule and wagon, a horse and a buggy. We had primitive ways and ways of antiquity uh, to move about, to go from one place to another. But when General Motors decided that with their modern day technology and with their workforce, they was able to provide uh, on the assembly line automobiles that now people no longer have to sit in a buggy and ride behind a mule. But now in the assembly line of General Motors putting out T-Model Fords and now people who were wealthy and was able to get an automobile now found themselves riding in comfort even back then. But look over the years in which every year since then vehicles have continued to be improved and more luxury cars and automobiles. Anything better than riding behind a mule. But look at this. I want to make the point that this is what a paradigm shift looks like. It's when you can move from riding behind a mule, oh God, and now operate in a T-Model Ford. Even then, but you know we got Rolls Royce, Cadillac, BMWs, Saab, Lexus. We have got all kinds of comforts of 
That in itself is a paradigm shift. Why, why is it a paradigm shift? Right? Well, a paradigm shift is the means in which the current way you have been operating, the current way in which you have been doing things, a uh, paradigm is the position in which we are now operating. But the shift comes when we think of new ways and nuances in this uh, 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 social media age. When we think of teleconference, YouTube, and all other mediums that are now available for us to use and maybe gone in this church anniversary, in this God year of celebrating our Lord for which what he has allowed us to be, that God has only allowed uh, so that we can experience a paradigm shift. Uh, can, can, can I use another example? Because I want to make sure that you are with me today. We've gone through too much hell already to not be clear and take the time and be methodical and be insightful of what God has laid on my heart this week. And I've been pondering, I've been meditating. What will you say today, Reverend? I'm glad you asked. Well, I gave you the instructions about General Motors and the assembly line as it relates to making automobiles. But can I bring you to a more relevant reference? It was since the shutdown. I didn't even realize that ventilators was even used in the hospital. But upon this shutdown, the president had to enact the production act. Oh, God, help me. To General Motors, the same example that I used from a T Model 4 to a Mercedes Benz Cadillac. Kind of like it may not be congruent well, just get the picture. <sighs> Ventilators were rare. President Trump ordered the Production Act for General Motors to now make ventilators. Can I say all I'm trying to say? That's a paradigm shift. It's when the emphasis is put on the production or the moving of where God is taking us. He will invoke the production act. Oh, God, help me today. And it is here that I want to purport that God is saying to us that on our 75th anniversary, God is saying to us, even on the closing or the ending of this timeline, his walk on this alleged journey, 37 days later, here we are. Jesus is now getting ready to go back to be with the Lord. 37 days later, he has come to grips with all that he has tried to do to prepare his disciples for this paradigm shift. And do you know, in three more days, Jesus is going to get up out of here, y'all. I'm glad that I have tried to be faithful in following the timeline because he's shown me some stuff I ain't never seen before. And I'm glad today that when the enemy comes in one way, the Lord will lift up a standard against him and he has to flee seven ways. Get to running and stepping. Satan, we going on anyhow. So what more can you say about this paradigm shift? I want to offer an historian, an individual by the name of Thomas Kahn, who is known in the science arena. He was a physicist, yeah, a physicist, and he was a philosopher. He was known for his uh, brilliance or his scientific understanding. It was Thomas Hahn who penned the idea of what it is to know or be in or understand a paradigm shift. And I'm glad for him because he has great credibility among uh, scholars and the understanding of science that was able to impart 
unto many of us what that means. And I thought to use today as a caricature or a working definition of Thomas Hahn, Kahn about the understanding of science and being able to recognize any method or model we have currently in place that there comes a time when we have to relook at how and why we do what we do. And there are ways in which we can purport or we can allow and participate in a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift does not come just because we want it to, but paradigm shifts come when things change. When, when resources are no longer available, when the church doors have been shut down, when we can no longer operate as we used to, and more important for the church, God is saying, a paradigm shift. How, oh, God? And so, my brothers and sisters, I come today as Jesus picks up at the text in Acts chapter 1, um, begin around verse 8. It is here we find that Jesus is now replacing Judas with Matthias. You know, the lot fell on Matthias to make the difference and to replace Judas, who was the one uh, that took his own life because he betrayed Jesus. It was here that uh, the text would let us know that in the that Jesus uh, is on the scene. And when we come to this particular book, and we find interestingly that their Bible says that there were two angels dressed in white apparel, as if when the disciples were looking up at Jesus go away, I'm sure their hearts were moved and touched. They were emotional. But there wasn't anything else for Jesus to do. He had done everything that he could do to prepare them in his departure. And they looked on him as if they were sad. And God allowed two angels to say to them, Ye men of Galilee, why are you standing there staring and looking unto the heavens? For the same Jesus who you see going up into the heavens is the same Jesus who is going to come in the like manner. And my brothers and sisters, God provided the angels to attest to the fact that he is leaving. It is in his resurrection that all things seem to be now set in place. That now the paradigm shift is about to take place. And so Jesus now goes on. And what I have also discovered about the book of Acts, it closes the gospel in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now we move into Acts. Which is the writer is Luke, one of uh, Jesus' uh, uh, contemporaries, the one who writes. Luke was a physician, and Luke is given the credit for writing the book of Acts. But the book of Acts, the first chapter, really, uh, the first part of the book of Acts, is broken down into two features. The first feature is attributed to Peter. The second part of the book of Acts is attributed to Paul. And may God be set in a precedent and a course of action for how it is that we are to take on this paradigm shift. And I've been asking the question all along since I've been following the timeline. God, why is it that you keep allowing Peter to come up into the picture? How is it that Peter keeps on creeping up into the equation? How is it that impetuous Peter, Lord, keep on, you, you did ask him three times, how much did he love you? And he got frustrated with you asking him that. But God, you had a reason for asking him that. He denied you three times. He denied you and the, before the crow, the rooster crow three times. He was going to deny you. Peter uh, has many uh, uh, references that he was not worthy. But the main thing that stands out about Peter, early on in the gospel, we find a conversation with Jesus and Peter. And it was Peter who establishes who Jesus is, and Jesus was pleased. Jesus applauded the revelation. He says to him, flesh and blood have not revealed unto you, Peter, but my father, I believe that on the basis of Peter's response, of his confession about Jesus, caused Peter to now soar in the book of Acts. It's not about Anybody, it's Peter is the one who stands here in the book of Acts because
God. I believe God put him first in this, uh, in the establishment of the church. Uh, the church is the, the, this is the beginning of the church. This is where the church starts. This is the church that Jesus speaks to. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. It is the establishment of the church, and while it part two, it is the expansion of the church. Oh God, how can we operate in a paradigm shift and not realize or understand that God is taking us to another level? God, I mean, we've been saying it all along. We're going higher. We're going to another level. We can see clearer. 2020, we can see better. All has come to fruition. As I look back over the last 37 days, when we started out with Ash Wednesday, the writer of the book says that we, the first thing is to slow down. Oh my God. And could it have been the prophecy of God that we've been shut down, we have been settled down, and we have been able now to hear God clearly, at least I know I have. And God is speaking parenthetically that Peter is the one who said who Jesus was. So God decided to use Peter in the book of Acts just before he leaves in the first half of Acts, about 13 or 14 chapters. It belonged to Peter. The second half of the book of Acts belonged to Paul. You see, God set this thing in order. You got to know what church. Peter is clear about the church. It's not the temporal church anymore. Oh, in some ways, it's never going to go away. But in terms of the paradigm shift, it can no longer be as business as usual. Why didn't God would you call for Second Baptist Church, 5100 West 100 Road, that all we've been through, that here today, Second Baptist Church get to celebrate 75 years of ministry. What are you telling us, God? I was not in my own business. I was just going away. Three days on Wednesday coming will be the day according to the timeline that Jesus is going to go back to the Father. Three more days after today, Jesus is going to get on the 747. Three more days, he's going to be taken up out of here. Three more days, he's going to rise above the clouds. Three more days, he's gone. And I'd like to believe that if there, if there was any communication, if there was any sound, if there was any voice made, Jesus was saying to those who looked upon him as he was going up into the cloud, Jesus decided to say to them, as we would say, Mama, Daddy, take care. I love you. See you when you get back. Jesus could not ascend totally into the clouds without making some type of response to his disciples or whatever they said. He just simply refers our response back to them. And his way up, he says to them, I love y'all too. Get ready for the next move of God. Get ready. For the paradigm shift. And there he goes. I've been wondering, God, why Peter keep coming up? I've been wondering, how is it that you keep showing me the trilogy of God? Here now on the day we celebrate 75 years. Ah, uh, three days from now, Jesus gonna go. I'm, I'm getting something out of that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. In three more days will be the end of 
Jesus being seen with his disciples. And as you know, 10 days following that, that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, comes. And it lands on each of them who are waiting in the upper room. Tap your neighbor and say, are you in the upper room? Are you waiting for this paradigm shift? Are you waiting to receive the true value and benefit and blessings of God? Yeah. Here's something else. 75 years in ministry. The church has existed for 75 years. <sighs> the trinity of God. Even in that. Because when I think about 75 years, I divide it by three. And when I divide it by three, it comes up 25, 25, 25 equals 75. Could it be that all of the Bishop McCray, who was the first pastor, who reigned for 25 years here at Second Baptist Church, he was a Methodist preacher. He just got tired of the enforced labor and dues thrusted upon the people. And he moved out of the Methodist movement and named it Second Baptist. After 25 years of Reverend Dr. McCray, now comes Reverend Dr. William Powell. He reigns for 25 years. God is saying something. The Trinity of God. And now, on the third leg, 25 years, it has been led by your children. I've only been able to do what the people have allowed me to do. I wasn't always ready, always prepared. And sometimes, see, like I still ain't. But God is good, and his mercy endured to all generations. I'm glad today that trouble don't last always. So what is your response? What is you trying to say, Reverend, in this trinity of God, Reverend McCray, Reverend Powell, and yourself? Could it be? I've been here for 26 years, I might add. And so we're not concerned about that one year out of tolerance, but just reflected on 75 years, comes in three dimensions. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. 25, 25, 25 equals 75. And maybe through their leadership over the years, down to this present moment, they have only moved the church as far as God allowed them to move it. But now yours truly has been here for the last 26 years, and they are uh, COVID-19 has crept in. Uh, Corona-19 has caused us to reshape and rethink our models for ministry. Business is no longer as usual. Oh yeah, I know folks still going to come to church, but the church that God is purporting for us to reach through cyberspace, through Zoom, through telemedia conferences, YouTube, Twitter, and all other social media resources. It's a new day. It's a paradigm shift. And God has set us up to move into the direction. How else could it be as we move to the end of this post-resurrection review? Three days away. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. Jesus is leaving. And that is to say to me, Jesus said, I've done everything that I need to do to prepare the church to move on beyond this point. It is now a paradigm shift. And we need to move in the direction that the Lord has caused us to move in. And I'm glad that the Lord will make a way somehow. And I'm glad that I was able to get this message on our anniversary 75 years. And I know we made some plans 
to do it real good. We made some plans to invite the members of our ministry over the years in which the Lord has allowed us to exist on this corner. And I'm glad that trouble don't last always. I'm glad that I was able to follow the trail. Yeah, unlike ever before. Lord, you've been mighty good. Yeah, I feel my help coming on. The Lord, I can see him now. When the angels said to his disciples, what the Lord is saying to us today, be of good courage and be of good cheer. The Lord is causing for a paradigm shift. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Back in the day, in the early church, there were folk that went to other people's house. Yeah, they would have a prayer meeting. Yeah, they would partake of communion. Yeah, they were all things in common. They pulled together their resources and their goods. Yeah, it was no doubt that they were a part of God's kingdom. Yeah, they could answer the question, do you, Jesus asked, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my little lamb. Yeah. They owe the church. They brought their good. They laid it at the feet of the apostles. Yeah. You know Ananias and Sapphira, don't you? Yeah. They brought their good. And they withheld the truth. It was theirs. All they had to do was just give it up. Yeah. I don't want to take much more time. I got to leave you now. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. I got to leave you now. Yeah. I feel all right. Won't they do it? Didn't they do it? Yeah. Yeah. We're getting ready. Get ready, Second Baptist. We're in a paradigm shift. Yeah, we will do our best to do what the Lord has called us to do. Yeah, I feel all right. Yeah, can't nobody turn me around. My help comes from the Lord. be thankful for. Yeah. What are you thankful for, brother? He woke me up this morning, started me on my way. Yeah. All of my family are yet still here. The family chain has not yet been broken. Yeah. I have so much to be thankful for. He gave me the opportunity to serve his people at Second Baptist Church. Yeah! And some other things that he has allowed me to do. Yeah! Won't we do it? Didn't we do it? I feel alright. Not only did he wake me up this morning, he started me on my way. Yeah! And clothed me in my right mind. The door of the church is open. I don't know who you are or where you are. You can receive Jesus right now. Wherever you are, just simply accept him as your personal Savior. And you will be saved. 
said, Jesus, I accept you in my heart. I'm a son, saved by grace. If you desire to be connected with this ministry all over the world, you can. We can oblige. We can accommodate. My brothers and sisters, I have to say that this did not start off the way that I thought it was going to start off. But it ended up good. Anyhow. Maybe I didn't say everything that I wanted to say, but I think I said what needed to be said. I want to say congratulations to Second Baptist and our observance of 75 years in ministry. And I believe God has even greater works for us to do in days and months and years to come. I'm privileged to serve this ministry. I'm honored and privileged to look to serve all who makes up the family and the kingdom of God all over the world. So I'm blessed today. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you for praying that somehow we would get through. God has blessed us today. I'm happy about that. I won't keep you any longer. May you continue to enjoy the beauty of this day and the sacredness of this hour. Now, God, by your grace and God, forgive us and keep us. We love you in Jesus' name. Peace.